Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, morning to the gentleman from Alaska. Uh, welcome to the April 2018 edition of the Community Paramedicine Insights Forum, sponsored by the National Association of State EMS Officials, the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health, and the Center for Leadership and, and Research in EMS. Kevin McGinnis can't be with us today. He had a flight that took off late. Uh, this is Gary Wingrove. I'll be filling in for him today. We have two speakers on our program today. Both are from Texas. We're going to have them do their own introductions. First, we're going to have Michael Gonzalez from Houston and then Julie Lahr from the Austin area. So, Michael, uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Good, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Gonzalez. I'm one of the associate medical directors for the Houston Fire Department and EMS. Um, I am also the program director for ESIN, or Emergency Telehealth and Navigation, which is the subject of our talk this afternoon. So thanks again for the opportunity to share this. So really this slide, and I've done variations of this talk, we are fortunate enough to be in year, really almost year four of operating ESIN. Um, this is a variation of a slide set and a lecture that I gave for the American College of Emergency Physicians, where we were describing really our experience when we cross the 10,000 patient mark line with Ethan. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a flash forward, we recently crossed 17,000 patients. So that's both a comment of how busy we are as well as how far ahead of time you have to submit um, slides for uh, presentations at some of these national conferences. So. As I mentioned, I'm in the city of Houston, and this obviously is an iconic slide from an iconic movie from an incredible event that everyone really of most generations is familiar with, although I've learned going out and lecturing on this topic that there's a whole generation that's almost never heard of Apollo 13, which is an interesting, <laughs> interesting topic to deal with in and of itself. Um, but the iconic phrase, sort of, Houston, we have a problem. Um, describes a problem that isn't really unique to Houston, at least what we are attempting to deal with with Ethan, or again, emergency telehealth and navigation. And that's really dealing with what a problem we are all increasingly familiar with, and that is sort of the low acuity patient, overstretched and overcommitted resources, and busy and increasingly growing uh, emergency department volume in your surrounding area. So. The other thing and the other reason I like the analogy to sort of the, the NASA mission is that like many of you, we know that failure isn't an option. So when we were building this program, when I started um, working with the fire department in 2013 to build this program, we knew that we, you know, like many things that we do, there's no, there's no room for failure, right? So we knew we had to build something that was both easy to use, safe, fast for our crews, um, but something that up, 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 upmost and foremost kept our patients safe um, and out of harm's way. So this experience will really tell you a little bit of how we've been able to do that and where we think we can both improve as well as uh, answer any questions that you all may have if, they, if the time allows. So just to give everybody a little bit of a frame of reference, this slide is just a little bit out of date. Um, the greater Houston area um, which is inside sort of the green bubble, it really is, uh, I guess the yellow there, the yellow loop includes a population of around 2.1 million population in the city proper, um, with really upwards of about 6 million in the region. The city of Houston itself covers more than 660 square miles, um, and we respond to really last year was almost a million EMS calls or calls for, for medical assistance. Um, those turn into approximately 500,000 unique EMS incidents and result in upwards of 400, 500 transports a day on a regular basis. In terms of the scale, we're a joint fire EMS. As I mentioned, we have 90 plus fire stations throughout this geographic region with really upwards of now 4,000 personnel um, who are, who when we started this needed to be trained on every aspect of it. So had its own challenges and certainly questions I'm happy to, to discuss offline. So Ethan, as I mentioned, emergency telehealth and navigation was born out of the problem that we've all faced, what to do with these patients that are increasingly taxing our resources. And really for the city of Houston represents a third or fourth 
iteration of trying to handle um, these patients. So our previous program, which has been described a little bit in previous literature, um, was called the Alternate Transportation Program, or ATP. And that program really involved utilizing either a nurse health line or a very commonly available um, algorithm that tried to assist crews in the field with trying to make a determination decision through conversation from the paramedic to either a nurse or the paramedic to a, another paramedic who was accessing the computer-assisted algorithm. Um, that program really ended for us right around 2011 um, and had, although a very ambitious goal, as I mentioned, trying to divert some of these potentially low acuity patients away from an ambulance ride and in a perfect world away from the ER as well, um, really was fraught with a few different problems. The, the, the algorithm itself, which was at the heart of both the nurse phone interaction as well as the computer algorithm um, assisted paramedic encounter, was really not built for 911 calls. It was really built for just like the insurance card that you have in your pocket was really built for you know, a regular consumer or patient um, reaching out to a nurse health line to try and get assistance on whether or not to even call 911. And then when plugged into our system, obviously with an imperfect solution, plugging very much a, you know, a square peg into a round hole, because 911 was already on scene. So our firefighters found themselves in some awkward situations where the, the recommended solution was call 911, which of course was easily adapted to, okay, well, we need to transport this patient. And despite some very ambitious work and really um, a lot of great work on a lot of the, part, the people here at both fire as well as some very ambitious paramedics, that program 80% of the time resulted in a recommendation to transport the patient. And as you might imagine, um, also sometimes extended the scene time by upwards of 20 or 30 minutes. So the program was both a bit slow to utilize and 80% of the time resulted in a recommendation to transport. So not surprisingly, the utilization from that went down very quickly, and in its busiest year of operation, handled somewhere around 380 encounters for the whole year. Um, so we knew we had that framework to work with, and we knew how to, we had a baseline that we had to not only surpass, but try to far exceed the, ex the expectations of our members. So really, Ethan is very much a chain, as the you know, chain of survival that we're all very familiar with working with implies. Ethan is really dependent on that as well. It starts with a 911 call. The vehicles or apparatuses that are dispatched, the personnel that are dispatched, does not change. Now that we've had Ethan in operation, that hasn't changed at all. We dispatch according to our standard protocol. The crews on scene will do a field assessment, including a set of vital signs, a quick you know, discussion with the patient, family, what is the reason for the call. And then they will initiate the call, and I'll show you a screen example of that here shortly, but they initiate a phone call or a tablet, a video conferencing call via the very same tablet that they carry to do their PCR and for a variety of other fire and EMS functions. So it is importantly a, not a different device. It is not their smartphone. It is not an additional piece of equipment. It's really the same. It's embedded in the same technology that they're already carrying in our vehicles and carrying with them to every single patient assessment. So at the time of the physician call, the physician then makes a disposition, and it can be one of a couple different things, and I'll show you the nine or ten different dispositions we have. But really for the physician, the choice is in initially, whether or not this patient has an emergency condition that, jet, that would require transport via ambulance. So certainly we're trying to improve our healthcare efficiency and improve the efficiency of our operation, but really, ultimately, our primary goal is, of course, trying to save our patients and the consumer market over, or the healthcare region overall, uh, spend those dollars more efficiently. So. The physician first determination is whether or not an ambulance is necessary, and then if the patient is safe for something other than an ER, can we get this patient to something other than an emergency department, be it a clinic, their own primary care physician, or whatever the case might be. Now the last part, and this is the and navigation part of Ethan, is really a Care Houston program, which is run independently by our Houston Health Department. 
an independent organization. Many of you have an organization like that, but this, this particular program within the City of Houston already existed for us and we worked quite closely with them in dealing with some of our high utilizers. So not necessarily low acuity callers, but patients who call, who frequent our 911 system and really um, can, can be demonstrated to be over, quote unquote, over using um, our resources. So we had already had a partnership with them to work on those patients and we developed a, an algorithm so that these patients, every single patient that was screened towards Ethan by the field crews would eventually get a follow-up visit by the Care Houston program, be it a phone call or if necessary, even a home visit. Um, so some of those high utilizers were wrapped up into the same, you know, Ethan encounter, um, but sometimes it was markedly different patients. So next slide really shows you from a purely demonstration sort of perspective what it looks like. This is from another event where we were presenting Ethan. Um, you can see one of our older monitors there in the picture. The tablet located on the lower right-hand corner of your picture really shows the Panasonic G1 that is used as our field device. The paramedic that's holding the device in front of this simulated patient is also that's the same device. But the television screen you see there on the left is really mirroring exactly what the patient is seeing. So the gentleman in the middle is the physician, and then there's a, much like your FaceTime or Skype, there's a smaller window on the left-hand side of the TV screen showing exactly what the patient is seeing. So really what we learned very quickly was that we, even though that many of us who have been in EMS for quite a while, spend a lot of time rehearsing and training, especially our new crews about doing an appropriate handoff at the bedside in the hospital, what we learned very quickly is that this actually works much better if the crew, when contacting the physician, does a very quick sort of one-liner statement. I have a 35-year-old gentleman who ran out of his medications, which is a very standard sort of Ethan um, encounter, and that's essentially it. In the background, through our uh, PCR, the, the field crew has already transferred a record directly from the field to the physician working that has the relevant demographics, a set of vital signs, and contact information for the patient. So the physician can then review those if necessary or clarify you know, what any relevant part about whether this may be a call to you know, a home or a, a business or something where there might be some special instructions that are required to care for the patient. So we're going to dive right into sort of the operational aspects, and I know there, there are probably questions, and I'm happy to again try and address those, but really um, this is sort of from, again, data of really that was probably middle of 17, and you can see that Medical Monday is true in the Ethan world as well as uh, just about every other place in the healthcare world. So Monday is one of our busiest days, if not consistently the busiest day, but you can see Wednesday, interestingly enough, is one of our busy days as well which is a, always a huge surprise, and I don't have a great explanation for that, um, but operationally this is what we're seeing where Wednesday is the second spike. Ethan is operated, as you can see, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock in the evening. Now this slide represents uh, Ethan encounters year to date, so that was from program inception, which was the last quarter of 2014. So from that time, we actually were only, when we first launched, we were only operational for 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So you can see that's where the bulk of those hours are, in, is, as well as that's always a, a very busy time for most, most EMS services. We've added 8 a.m. all the way to midnight, and there's actually a second physician available sitting sort of a second chair between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m., which you can see are sort of the busiest times. We do get questions from our field crews all the time about expanding the hours, and we're actually considering um, adding a two or three additional hours to take us from 8 a.m. to essentially around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, but again, this is something we review very carefully with respect to monitoring the number and acuity of 911 calls. So we're currently not in operation 24-7. I don't foresee moving to 24-7 anytime soon. Um, but we certainly are considering expanding the hours yet again. In terms of demographics of the patients that have been referred to us by our crews, 
Um, not surprisingly, the young uh, population is sort of the biggest uh, spike here. Almost 30% are patients between the ages of 18 and 34, with 55% of those being female patients. So initially, when we first started running this, I sort of expected that it was really going to be the third spike over, or the 51 to 64. And that's the second largest group, as you can see from the slide. Um, but really, after we sort of analyzed this, talked with some of our crews, been out there in the streets with our crews, talking with them about what they're doing, remember that our crews are the ones that have to initiate Ethan. This is not a patient-initiated encounter. So it's really kind of not that surprising that a lower, a younger rather, potentially healthier, usually healthier patient population would be those that they feel the most comfortable initiating for an Ethan encounter. Because remember, in terms of what we do for our activation of Ethan, we really don't have, I get a lot of questions about willingness to share our algorithm for Ethan. And I'll be really honest with you, we don't have a very complicated algorithm. We have a very small number of inclusion and exclusion criteria like any good EMS protocol, but really, it, is, it boils itself down to if this was a family member, would you feel comfortable sending them somewhere other than an emergency department? And so with that being said, we have a few rare exceptions, chest pain, obvious emergency, stroke-like symptoms, obvious trauma. But even then, what we really I tell, our patient, tell our crews is that if this patient, as I said, is a, were a family member and you felt comfortable doing it, even if the call came in as shortness of breath, and really when you get on scene you find out it's an albuterol inhaler refill, please activate Ethan. Like we, we really want people, our crews, to use the experience that they have had um, to make decisions about what is the next, or what's the appropriate destination. And the physician is always there to sort of help augment that decision. Importantly, I should note that our crews really do have the ability to say, based on something that the physician may not be able to see, um, some angry family members that are gathering or something happening on scene where the scene is potentially becoming unsafe, the crew can step in and say, hey, doc, I'm really feeling, you know, I really, we're based on something that's happening here, we're going to transport this patient. So there's always the safety valve on the, on the side of the patient and then on the side of the physician, they can always, they can recommend that a patient be transported by, by cab, and they are actually given the authority through our city of Houston, given the authority to say to the patient that we're, we won't be transporting you by ambulance. So one of the significant dispositions that we use a lot, especially in the intervent or in the assessment that we've all seen is a patient calls for assistance, it's a medication refill or some other minor issue and really wants to go to the ER. Ethan can intervene at that point and the physician can speak with the patient directly, inform them that really, you know, based on the complaint, their stable vital signs, your healthy, your past medical history, we really feel like this is probably not an, an ambulance transport in and of itself is not required. So we're going to help you get to the ER. But as you can see, let me see if I can make this pointer thing work. We're going to try and get you there instead by cab, right? So the next slide, I think it gets you, yeah, there we go. So as you can see, this includes, this is up to 13,000 uh, patient encounters. And I've, as I've said, we've now topped the 17,000, and this number has dropped again. So utilizing Ethan, really uh, only around 10 or 12 percent are requiring are receiving the recommendation from the physician to require ambulance transport. And this is really much, very much in line with a lot of other um, programs in other systems around the country that have really uh, tried to do some paramedic determined destinations that um, can result in a no transport. So this is, our data is very much in line with that. And often when the physician has overridden the Ethan activation and really in initiated an ambulance transport, we found it's often some complicated medical history or some fact that the patient themselves or the family hadn't divulged until they got on screen with the physician. And as you all know, anyone in healthcare, the history changes about 16 times before they get to the hospital. And that's true in our experience here as well. The other thing I want to note um, on this slide is that really um, 
Ethan is as much an, an IT or an information technology project as much as any. And we've had a, you know, some great partnerships that we were able to work with some great groups to help us with this. And so we always highlight that really very few of our patients um, have been unable to complete this because they don't, they can't. Something's wrong with the, the IT uh, infrastructure. We have double that that really just decide, you know, we do we really don't want to talk to you, Doc. Like, I just want to go. So, in that instance, usually some other protocol is utilized, and only a few of those actually end up being an ambulance transport. Um, but showing these are our statistics there to, as I said, probably early 17. As of date recently, uh, with the report that I ran this morning, we were at just over 18,000, probably 18,500. And this overall disposition number dropped uh, to 12% in terms of patients that were activated and transported by ambulance. Let's see, I'm gonna move to the next slide here. So one of the major questions we always get is, uh, great, Ethan is working, but how did you pay for it and how does this save anybody money? So now for this group, I'm gonna run through these slides. I know that you're very savvy about how this works, but I will tell you that we were very fortunate enough that Texas was one of a few states that received um, something called the 1115 waiver uh, when the Affordable Care Act was rolled out. And Texas is one of the states that passed on the option to expand Medicare and Medicaid. As a result of that, some healthcare dollars at the federal level were targeted for some of these states to try and utilize healthcare dollars more efficiently. So we were very fortunate to receive some grant funding from the federal government and continue to do so. And so some of a, a good majority of the, at least the salary dollars for some of the staff is covered by that. There are some other costs related to the utilization of cabs as well as some of the healthcare destinations. As I uh, didn't talk about but should have mentioned, let me see if I can go back very quickly. Um, a clinic appointment, so the, a clinic appointment can be booked directly by the physician, right? So a physician can offer a patient an alternative. You can see not as many patients as we would like take advantage of these. So a lot of patients, as all of you know, have used the ER services before and just know that the ER can be a one-stop shop and it will solve lots of problems for many people. So sometimes they just wanna go there. You can see that this is becoming a very increasingly uh, popular disposition decision where the patient declined a clinic referral. In other words, the physician determined that a clinic was appropriate, was offered that, and the patient themselves declined it. So. This number is probably the fastest growing of all of our dispositions, and it wasn't added as a separate disposition until about last quarter of 15, so that one is growing uh, very quickly. So a little bit about sort of how Ethan operates, and you can probably guess where the, the savings come in. So for a standard, we're gonna use some round numbers. For a standard 911 call when a patient is transported to the ER, it generates a hospital I mean, an ambulance bill, whether that bill um, eventually gets paid or not is highly variable, of course, depending on your locale. For us, that uh, is more often than not not paid than paid. But in some, in some way, a bill of about $1,000 gets generated just for the transport, right? And then once you get to the ER, particularly for a low acuity visit, that hospital visit can range, is a widely variable charge, but just for the purposes of the discussion, we'll use $1,200 for the ER bill itself. So a low acuity visit, somewhere on the order of at least $2,000 uh, for, for each of our patients in a pre-Ethan world. With Ethan, obviously we avoid the ambulance transport if it's safe to do so. And again, the physician is really the one given the determination or the disposition decision unless something is happening on scene that would result in the crew's overriding or potentially expressing some concern there. Otherwise, the physician would be the one making the disposition decision. All of our physicians, as I, I think I mentioned, but if not, all of our physicians are emergency medicine board certified physicians. So if a taxi is picked as the, as the transport, whether they go to a clinic or an ER, automatically the cost of the taxi is really not passed along to the consumer or our patient. So the city of Houston is currently subsidizing that, so that's a $20 um, 
cost to the city, but certainly in terms of savings of other, other areas that I'll show you in a minute, um, is not passed along to the patient or the family member or the third party payer. And then of course, depending, depending on the destination decision, the cost of the $1,200 ER visit is still borne by the patient or the payer versus if we can get you in a clinic and they accept it, somewhere around a $200 charge. So somewhere in the range of $1,220 cost that can be avoided down to the level of you know, less than 200 or right around $200 if you take advantage of all the potential cost saving dispositions. Again, if it's safe to do so, right? So always we wanna keep our patient safety um, foremost in our minds. Now, this is a slide that most often audiences like yourselves are most interested in in terms of how does it really help how does it really help the fire department? How does it help improve our operations? Well, on a good day, we generally have, let me get to the slide here that I need. On a good day, we get six minutes to response time, right? So 911 call, dispatch, six minute response. They may spend, our crews may spend somewhere, let's use for the purposes of discussion, 15 minutes on scene, and then let's say 25 minutes because Houston is a huge city covering a huge square mile. We have 43 different hospitals we deliver to. So let's say 25 minutes to really get, or 25 minutes waiting for the first responding apparatus, waiting for an ambulance to get on scene. Let's say this is a low priority call. They got dispatched alone. So the ambulance can take upwards of 20 more minutes to get there and then another 30 minutes in traffic depending on Houston weather, which is widely variable, um, that can be you know, even higher than that. But let's, for the purposes of the discussion, let's say 30 minutes. And then of course, handing off in the emergency department. And we all know that these low acuity patients are often the ones that take the longest to offload because the ERs are very busy. In spite of having a, a many, many emergency departments to deliver to, um, we really find that some of our crews are getting held up there for 20, 30, 40, you know, sometimes upwards of an hour particularly for low acuity patients because there's no room available or because the waiting room is full um, or for a variety of reasons that you all know very well. Well, when you add all that up, that's almost two hours of time, two hours of time, operational time, right? To say nothing of the cost of gas and other things, just wear and tear on the vehicles, but 121 minutes of crew time utilized on a low acuity patient. With our Ethan program, as you might guess, we save exponentially on this, right? So we still have the six minute response time, still have the 15 minute making a disposition decision, but that includes then approximately 12 minutes, which is really about five or six minutes is the average length of the Ethan call. So the physician speaking directly with either the crew themselves or the crew and the patient, as is often the case. So 12 minute total for that entire encounter. Once that is true, our crews clear the scene. There are times that we ask for our crew to stay on scene until the cab has arrived, but our cabs, our, our collaboration with our local cab company, really most of the cabs get there within 10 minutes. So even if the crew stays on scene, in this example they did not, 33 minutes if they were cleared the scene as soon as a physician disposition was made. But even if they stayed on scene waiting for the cab to get there and help load the patient into the taxi, because let's say it may have been an ankle sprain where the patient is still ambulatory and weight bearing, we're still talking about 33 to 45 minutes at most, a significant, still a significant reduction in terms of the crew operational time and commitment of resources. So as I mentioned, sort of some of the things that we highlight when we speak about Ethan is that really less than 15% of our patients, and you all probably experience some of the same numbers in terms of the overall rate of patients that you just feel anecdotally, whether you're tracking it independently, of patients that really require ambulance transport, right? So we are, our aim is certainly to decrease ED utilization, and we certainly have done that a little bit by offloading some of the disacuity to patients that are either able to handle, are able to get a primary care appointment, in, whether it's in their own 
their own clinic or whether they choose one of our partner clinics where we're able to arrange an appointment. The physician does that at the same time of the evaluation. We're trying to decrease the, the ED utilization, but potentially based on those costs, right, upwards of 80% savings to the patient themselves and or their payer. Um, and really there's upwards of $1,000 savings even if we avoid, or somewhere around $1,000, even if all we do is avoid the ambulance transport. So in terms of our operational efficiency, just in the time reduction for those patients on those low acuity patients, and obviously I don't, won't pretend to know anything about your individual systems, but for us, we know that those are increasingly the fastest growing rate of EMS calls on any given year. So they were placing an increasing burden on, an, as I mentioned, an already stressed um, infrastructure. We are in discussions um, to potentially expand Ethan operations with some local partners. Um, we're looking at a variety of collaborations with other organizations, including payers of health and healthcare systems to try and potentially incorporate a more traditional community paramedicine model as well to potentially equip a few vehicles that may be specially outfitted um, to do some follow-up that maybe a patient is really what they required was a, you know, a medication refill. Well, instead of trying to get them all the way to their primary care doctor, maybe what we really need to do is get them over you know, to a pharmacy, as an example. I know many of you are doing programs that really do have, a, have done some amazing work in that tr more traditional community paramedicine space, and we're, we're interested in learning just about, as much about that. In our world, and at least under current Ethan operations, we're really, we're really focused on utilizing this teleconferencing capability that we built in because every single unit in our fleet, every single fire apparatus, every single Ethan, everything, every single Ethan e EMS apparatus, excuse me, um, has the capability to do, to initiate and complete an Ethan encounter. So knowing that, you can see that really it's, it's primarily those events where whether through dispatch protocol or simply through availability and proximity, a non-transport vehicle is the first one to arrive. They are really the ones that are able to, to initiate Ethan and complete an Ethan encounter without an EMS vehicle being on scene. Because we're a joint service, every single one of our fire trucks carries almost exactly the same personnel. We just need to make it so that, um, and really for on the patient side, and this is based on interviews as well as with our crews as well as some patients who, who we have had Ethan activated for, it's really the easiest quote unquote sell, right? I'll use that for lack of a better term, when the transport vehicle is not available, right? So patients see a fire truck pull up, they're not gonna assume, they automatically are assuming I'm not gonna get a ride in a fire truck. So they know, intuitively, they know that I'm not getting a ride in a fire truck. It's, a little more complicated and many of you have probably dealt with it, right? An ambulance pulls up, well, why aren't you going to take me? So sometimes that does require a little work on the side of the physician to explain to them that, listen, this is a safe, perfectly safe alternative to get you to the emergency department based on the medical complaint that you've given and the history that I've already walked you through. So again, I want to reinforce that, that that call on average lasts about five and a half minutes. And that includes arranging a clinic appointment, and if necessary, dispatching a cab to get to the patient. So I see that I'm coming up on about five minutes, so I'm gonna wrap my presentation up, hand it over to Julie. I'll put this slide up for a minute. A good friend of mine who is a fan, I'm also a graphic designer, did this for me. I think it looks awesome. So I, I'm also available by the email address there as well as the, the whole new social media world. So I invite your questions, comments, and uh, I will hand it over to Julie. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about Ethan, and I look forward to hearing from you. All right. Howdy. That was awesome, Mike. Um, so my name is Julie Lahr, and um, I am a community paramedic. Um, I have been in... EMS first responder world for about 16 years. I'm going to go ahead and click over to my side, I guess, as cool as Mike's is. I guess we got to get mine, mine rolling here. 
Um, and I think my understanding is there was a little bit of issue with slide transition, so bear with me. We'll see how these kind of um, roll through. Um, okay, so yeah, again, 16 years in EMS. Um, I worked initially as a firefighter, EMT, and then went on to medic school, worked as a single role medic um, for eight years in San Diego in a pretty busy system. And then from there, I went on to um, Williamson County, which is the county just north of Austin, Travis County. I actually have all this in the slides, so let's see if we can get to that. Okay, so we have no, <laughs> it looks like we have no pictures. Okay. Um, okay, we will wing, we will wing this. Um, so I'll go ahead and continue. Um, and so when I got to Williamson County, I worked for a year in the field as a regular field medic. Um, and then from there, they started their community paramedic program. So as Mike mentioned, the 1115 waiver through the federal government, um, that is what our county received as well. And so uh, we started a community paramedic program under EMS. Um, so I did that for a year. That program entailed um, basically doing high utilizers in the system as well as a um, hospital readmission reduction program with CHF and COPD patients. So I'm just gonna scroll through here really quick and kind of see if there's anything on these slides that actually do, <laughs> oh boy, do you show up here? Um, okay, we'll see what we can do. Okay, so um, from there, we have a sister program in EMS. Um, it is called MOT, the Mobile Outreach Team. And so that is the mental health crisis team in the county. Uh, they respond to 911 calls just as EMS does. They sometimes respond with EMS or PD. Most of the time they go on their own. Uh, they respond to a lot of school calls, a lot of suicide school calls and other things, but they do also have a radio and kind of respond in the 911 system. Um, so that program also received a chunk of the 1115 waiver, and they set up a community paramedic program as well. Um, and so we had kind of two sister community paramedic programs, which was great. That program took high utilizers with primary mental health diagnosis. So I worked for a year with EMS um, under their community paramedic program and found that I was kind of taking all of the patients that nobody wanted. <laughs> um, and so those typically ended up being the very squirrely mental health patients that were really kind of difficult to make any headway with, which kind of then led me over into the mental health crisis team into their community paramedic program. I was kind of um, working on patients with them quite a bit. So after the first year, they had an opening, and I went over into their program and have worked three years um, in their program as well. So I did want to mention there is notes um, where that you can type questions or if things don't make sense. Please feel free to do that at this point. It looks like my slides are going to be a little squirrely, um, so I'm kind of just going to go on. But if things don't make sense, if I'm speaking too fast or there's no visuals to help with this, please feel free to fire off a question in, in the written section and I'll try and clarify as we go. Um, okay, so once I got over to the mobile outreach team, that team is made up of six mental health specialists, which are either licensed social workers or licensed professional counselors. And they were running separately on their own, and then we had a community paramedic program. So they were running um, crisis calls in the 911 system, and the community paramedic program was running, again, the kind of longer-term non-acute management, like typically you kept a patient for 90 days, and we were managing these high utilizers working. We were trying to navigate, you know, health insurance, um, you know, kind of the standard like transportation, doctor's appointments, food, things like that. But then again, all of our patients had um, a really strong mental health component, which generally was kind of keeping them from making their appointments. So it just kind of adds a whole, whole other level um, to those patients. So what I kind of started seeing was, gosh, like there's a lot of calls working in the system as a paramedic, and then now seeing this mental health crisis team, I was like, why, why aren't we working together? There are so many calls we could use this amazing team on. There was just kind of a big communication breakdown and a big misunderstanding of what the mobile outreach team did and how the paramedics worked. It was just 
two kind of big, very different cultures that weren't exactly working as well as they could have been. So after I was there for about a year, um, I kind of started dreaming, brainchilding, um, maybe a new response of how we could work a little bit better. Um, So I started doing some homework and found out that, in fact, in our system, our third highest call was behavioral health calls. So overdoses, psychiatric, um, homeless, anything that kind of fell under that window, we had a high, high level of those calls. Um, and so what was interesting was many of the calls that were coming through EMS because of the federal dispatch, the mobile outreach team wasn't actually getting because there was some kind of initial medical component. So it would come out of shortness of breath, even though it was an anxiety call. And so EMS would arrive on scene and basically just pick them up and say, all right, we'll just go to the hospital. Um, The other kind of issue that we had was that the mobile outreach team did not have code three vehicles. They were not equipped to do that. And at any given time, there were usually maybe two or three of them on to cover the whole county. And so um, basically there could be up to an hour plus response time from the time the medics requested the mental health crisis team, it could take them quite a bit of time, which as we know, most EMS units don't have that kind of time to wait. So I uh, created a response model, it looks like the slides didn't show up, um, called M&M, and that was basically stands for medical and mental health. So I created a, a combo response, had one community paramedic from our team and then one mental health specialist, and we had a Tahoe set up kind of specifically for this response. Um, We ran a pilot for six months, and we were able to write, we kind of pieced it together with existing staff and funding that we had from the grant and the county-funded program. Um, We kind of pieced it together. And um, let's see if any of these, oh, okay. Okay. We we pieced it together, ran it on Tuesdays for 12 hours a day. And so basically what we did was we self-initiated calls, anything we would look at the dispatches, anything that looked like a potentially behavioral health type of issue, we would go ahead and respond to. And um, our goal was to be there within 10 minutes of the time the ambulance arrived. So um, ideally, that would give the ambulance enough time to kind of identify, like, this patient absolutely doesn't need an emergency department. It's not a primary um, medical complaint. And then we were arriving about the time they kind of got all that situated, and basically we would take over the call from there, and we were able to release the ambulance back into the field. Um, From there, they would get a mental health assessment right in the field with the mental health specialist. And then I wrote some expanded medical protocols. We partnered with one of the local psychiatric hospitals and were able to kind of push some boundaries with them about what they would be willing to take direct from the field. Typically in our county, at least, they're very conservative because they don't have a medical doctor on staff. And so they, you know, typically wouldn't take a blood pressure over 120 wouldn't take a blood sugar over 400. There are a lot of different kind of stringent things that they wouldn't take. And so we kind of sat down in a room and I said, you know, here's our medical director, here's your medical director, here's some things I think we can do. And um, we kind of worked together. And then I got a, a finalized set of essentially medical clearance protocols that we could do in the field. And that would then bypass an EMS transport and bypass, you know, an ED visit for these folks that potentially either needed to just stay home with a safety plan or needed to be transported directly to an inpatient psychiatric facility. Um, There's a statistic, the average chest pain bed takes three to four hours in an emergency department and the average mental health bed can take up to eight days because they're stuck waiting for a bed. So it's very costly, it's very irritating to them. A lot of times patients will go to the ER Um, be seen by a doctor, potentially leave AMA before the social worker even gets a chance to talk to them about placement, if the hospital even has a social worker. So there's definitely a lot of problems with kind of taking uh, somebody who has a mental health complaint directly to an emergency department, obviously not really the best resources for them there. So 
we had the expanded medical protocols. We had breathalyzers and urine analysis, things that we could kind of use to just expand a little bit to kind of narrow it down um, for, again, just getting those direct inpatients from the field to the psychiatric hospital. Um, something else really cool that we had is a county P card or a county purchasing card. Each one of our team members have a card and they're able to use that to do anything to mitigate a crisis. So if someone needs medicine, we were able to just go out and get the medicine. If they got kicked out of their house and needed a place for the night, we were able to get them a hotel, um, lots of stuff like that, which worked really well for us. Um, and so we also did um, something similar to Mike. We also have telepsychiatry that we were able to provide. So once the mental health specialist kind of identified this would be really good if we could get you in front of a psychiatrist right away. What you need is the medicine that you have it. You know you need, but you haven't had in a year because you don't have a prescription. In Texas, the average wait for a psychiatrist was anywhere from six to eight months. Um, and when people are in crisis, it just wasn't really <laughs> serving them well. So we were able to put them in front of a psychiatrist in our office and get either a direct inpatient recommendation from the psychiatrist or medicine prescriptions, which we printed and then went and purchased with our P cards for the patients. So um, the great thing about that, after the initial crisis call, then we had our community paramedic program already in place to work with these patients to then follow up with them for about 90 days to ensure that they are stabilized, they, that they have good resource navigation, they do have transportation, they are getting their doctors, they have insurance to pay for their medicines. Um, and we were also able to monitor them, you know, monitor their health if needed, if there was kind of something specific um, with their chronic stuff that they needed to be monitored. Okay. Um, let's see what we can see about this. So a lot of times people ask, what kind of training um, did we do for this? So. The paramedics, the community paramedics, we did an assist training, which is um, a two-day suicide workshop, how to identify and work with suicide. We did um, also a hearing voices workshop, and it was a psychiatrist who is schizophrenic who created this whole interactive experience about what it's like to hear voices and kind of be um, schizophrenic. Really powerful workshop if you ever get a chance. And then we also did uh, mental health first aid. And that was kind of the basic building block of the training that we did. Um, each one of us kind of branched off and picked some more specific things that we were interested in and kind of, kind of took specialties like hoarding or overdose prevention, different things. But those were the kind of building blocks that all of us did. Um, on the mental health specialist side, they are not medically trained. They are social workers and counselors, as I mentioned. So they did do CPR first aid. They did a Narcan administration training, and then they did some emergency vehicle driving training as well. Um, something that was really powerful for us also as far as training that wasn't necessarily a class, and we had weekly staff meetings where we all sat together in staff cases that we had were kind of struggling with, difficulties, didn't know where to go, things like that. And so through that experience sitting at the table, we really kind of learned about each other's worlds, which we did find, and I'll get into kind of some issues that we had, but um, social workers definitely have a different pair of goggles and speak a different language than paramedics and community paramedics. So really kind of getting to sit together on a weekly basis and kind of understand oh, okay, you know, I understand what you're saying. I don't really see it that way. This is what I'm saying. You really kind of had to work together to kind of create like a mutual respect and then make things really a lot smoother on scenes when we were kind of speaking with each other. So, oh boy. <laughs> um, I'm actually just going to take a pause for half a second here and pull up my slides just so that I can make sure I'm hitting all of this. Bear with me here. I apologize. Okay. So some of the big issues that we had in our program um, were charting and data tracking were two big things that we really struggled with. Um, at current, as far as we have found, if anyone has suggestions, we are open. 
Um, so we had a full mental health assessment from the mental health specialists that needed to be charted, as well as a full kind of on-scene medical um, chart. And then on top of that, we also had a follow-up where we had kind of a chronic patient chart for three months that we needed to do. And so what we found is there was mental health charting software. There's some community paramedic charting software, but there's not really a crisis chart. So really finding something that all, all of us could, could um, chart in in the same place and keep the records was really difficult. And that difficulty led to data tracking as well. So how we were tracking this pilot became really tricky because <laughs> certain things were in this chart, certain things were in that chart. Certain, we had three, we ended up with three different charting softwares um, for this pilot. Um, the other thing that kind of got interesting for us was um, working with the other first responder entities, so the paramedics, the um, fire side, and then the law enforcement side. Um, we worked a lot with the EMS side before we started the pilot and did a lot of education, did a lot of presenting about this is what we're going to do. Um, and so everyone's really excited about it. But what we found is once we got into the field, um, it was kind of like, well, how do we call you? What can we do? It kind of caught really qu way quicker than we were expecting. Um, and fire wanted to call and law enforcement wanted to call. And we just kind of ended up with more business than we could handle. And then perhaps every homeless person that needed a room, well, we'll just call these guys. So we, we kind of had to backpedal a little and really kind of create some boundaries of here, here are things we can assist you with. Like just because we have a credit card doesn't mean we can use it for every patient. And, um, you know, right now we're going to work specifically with EMS until we really work out the nuts and bolts. And, you know, law enforcement was like, well, we don't want to go through EMS. We want to call you and fire and stuff. So we did have a little bit of squirrely communication. It um, was pretty easily hashed out with just kind of going to some morning lineups for different things. And um, we just didn't expect uh, everyone to, to really uh, want it quite so quickly. Um, some other issues, as I mentioned, just kind of, um, you know, working like community paramedics working alongside the mental health specialists. There were very different cultures just as far as communicating on scene as well as even just different response. Um, we did respond from time to time, code three. It wasn't our um, general response. We would usually just try and be there within 10 minutes. But there were certain times during traffic, this, that, and the other where we did. And, um, just different levels of urgency between the two kind of entities. And so working out some of those um, kind of funny things. And then, so post-pilot, we did have some financial struggle, as I think a lot of programs did. Our program was funded predominantly by the 1115 waiver, and that was really dicey for a while. And we, nobody was really sure if the extensions were going to come through and this and that, and the county was kind of unsure. So we, we struggled for about nine months um, about, you know, how are we going to continue this? How are we going to fund this? And some different things that got pretty hairy. Um, that has all been squared away at this point, thankfully. Here we go. We've got one slide for you today. Um, so some things that we did, did find out that worked really well. We did, um, we had about 100 patients that we did in our pilot. We were able to convert just over 70% of them from an EMS transport emergency department, and we did do even some jail diversions, um, which were great. Um, so we felt overall it was really successful. We saved quite a bit of money for the county, the patients, and um, certainly the first responder agencies as well. Um, we did get some great community partner buy-in. Um, like I said, initially, we, we really kind of focused on EMS because we felt they would be our initial partner, but um, by the end of the pilot, everyone was really um, kind of impressed and thrilled with the work that we were doing. And so um, that kind of led to some partnerships that we're into now with the fire department and different things. Um, some things that we learned along the way that we were kind of surprised about, um, as it turned out, we were seeing a lot of overlap in our community paramedic program with the patients that we were managing there. And then the patients that we were running the crisis calls in the field. Um, so oftentimes the paramedics didn't realize that they were in our community paramedic program, but 
so they would just go ahead and take him to the ER. But then when we were arriving on scene, we were very familiar with these patients to let the EMS go and just kind of manage them any way that they needed at that point. Um, that happened at least once a week. We had our pilot once a week. Once a week, we generally ran into one of our existing patients, or we were able to actually sign up a patient and enroll them into the program, which was really great. Um, we definitely, again, like I kind of keep hitting on this, learned about kind of the importance of having that language uh, specifically with each other, with the difference in the social workers and the, and the community paramedics. And then we had just ended up with not expecting at all way more business than we could handle. Um, all of the agencies were really thrilled that there was kind of somebody who would take these patients who kind of nobody really knew exactly what to do with. And so that, that kind of fell to us and everyone was <laughs> thrilled about that. And um, so that, yeah, where is the program now? Um, so just this month, um, it passed through that one of the uh, fire departments was really excited about the work that we were doing in their city. And so they stepped up and wanted to partner with the m, &M program. So um, they're going to sponsor the program for a year and we'll be running um, heavily in their city, which is exciting. It'll be five days a week now for 10 hours a day. Um, and also we're going to be introducing with that as well an overdose prevention program that's going to um, go into effect this month as well. So we're kind of adding just some other uh, programs into the m, &M response. It just kind of gives us a bigger toolbox uh, for us to work with. So. I would love if anybody has some questions. Um, that is the last slide, and I have a feeling I ran through them quickly because I was not able to see. So does anybody happen to have any questions? OK, uh, before I unmute the lines for questions, um, I need to apologize to Julie for the way her slides turned out. Julie has a really cool presentation that shows up well when she does it live. Um, unfortunately, the system we use over the internet doesn't allow for bullet points to pop up. And so we had to actually convert it between two programs to get it to, to work at all. And uh, so um, the issue with Julie's slides is my issue and not hers. And um, so Julie, sorry about that. Um, uh, but uh, we, we didn't have time to ask you to go back and redo your entire slide presentation. Uh, so again, I apologize for the way that turned out. I'm going to unmute everybody's lines now, and we'll open it up for questions and answers. The conference has been unmuted. All right, who's going to be first? Oh, this usually isn't a quiet group. <laughs> well, Julie and Mike, obviously you did an excellent job with your presentations because we we're not having any questions, so that's okay. Uh, we will post this on the uh, Kermanek Foundation's Facebook page later tonight, and it will be linked on the cpif.communitykermanek.org website in the archive section along with all the other shows that we've had over the last several of years. And Kevin will send out an announcement about uh, the date and time for our next program. So thank you everyone for joining and thanks Mike and thanks Julie for doing the presentation today. We appreciate it. Of course, happy to do sure, it. Thank you so much. All right, so nice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.